Well, Mark, good morning, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with us. We are truly honored and excited to have this opportunity with you, and also so very appreciative of you taking this time with us. So I wondered if you could uh, give us a sense of what you think needs to be done to make sure that this moment of opportunity leads to real climate action and not another decade of worthy but insufficient actions. Well, there is a big reset, a big strategic reset, virtually across every sector of the economy. Um, and that's taking place at a time when the climate crisis has been uh, becoming more urgent, uh, front of mind. And so the question that's being asked of businesses, um, and certainly in the financial sector that we're asking as part of the COP process is, well, if you have a new strategy, which you have to because of these other changes in the economy and society through COVID, What's your strategy for net zero? In other words, how will you manage yourself uh, towards a net zero footprint? Or is your strategy actually to manage the company out of business over that period of time and wind it down, which is a viable strategy, um, of course, uh, for some and a necessary for some in some sectors. Um, and of course, the third option is the one one doesn't want to hear, uh, but would be revealed by this process, it, which would be that some banks, some institutions, some, some companies might think, well, actually, we won't get to net zero. Um, I'll worry about that later. It's a problem for someone else, and they're effectively free riding. Well, this moment, um, this difficult period is, is a way of, it's a forcing mechanism to reveal who has a plan um, to meet society's goals. I mean, we're, we're speaking to each other virtually, but both of us in Canada, um, and of course, Net zero is a, a legislated objective in our country. It's, a, it's an objective in 120 other countries around the world, passed by the various parliaments and authorities. Um, and if you're operating in that environment, whether you're in the financial sector or the quote, real economy, um, it's important to be consistent with that. So I'm more um, optimistic about the, uh, um, the recognition of the challenge and um, uh, and uh, the importance of um, revealing uh, what the strategy is. But of course, that comes back to what our topic is, um, which is climate action. And um, setting the objective is one thing. Developing the strategy to achieve the objective is an entirely different, uh, different matter. And that's uh, what we all need to work together towards. This challenge is, is so fundamental. And that raises really the issue then of the importance of multilateral action. Um, and the United Nations system through the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change delivered the Paris Agreement now almost four years ago. And in March of 2019, you spoke about the urgency and potential for creating a new path to break what you call the tragedy of the horizon of climate change, which I think is a really, really powerful phrase. Um, so from your point of view, what is needed now from the multilateral system in order to del deliver that, that promise of Paris and uh, the potential for halting this tragedy? And more specifically, how could the UN encourage and support governments to deliver the scale of climate action that is truly needed? So the first thing that's needed is for countries to get back on their original track of what they had uh, intended to do, what they had pledged for Paris. And then some, of course, because we've used up five years of the carbon budget uh, in the interim. Um, so those new NDCs from uh, countries, 193 countries around the world that will be prepared for Glasgow and, um, need to be have very high ambition. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, what's needed in the UN system is working this way in the UK as the president, along with Italy, are very much uh, engaged in this, is to have subnational, regional, provincial, municipal, and other governments engaged and having their own commitments, having the third sector, the educational sectors, their own commitments, and then having the private sector, which is where I'm focusing my time, specifically the private financial sector, having their own objectives, so that this is cascading down. It's not just at the, the multilateral level or the national level, but it's coming down to the level of our communities, our companies, our communities, our schools, our institutions. Um, and what are we all doing to move towards these objectives? Now, um, these processes are, can be incredibly powerful. I mean, as we all know, the United States is, uh, has signaled its intention to leave uh, the Paris Accord. Um, uh, and yet, regional governments, uh, over uh, you know, uh, 50 major municipalities in the US, 
have uh, very clear uh, objectives through something called America's Pledge, which will make a huge difference. I will tell you that in terms of the financial sector, every major Wall Street bank, every major asset manager in the US, every major pension fund is committed to the financial agenda that we have, which has a simple objective, which is to put in place by Glasgow, by the COP in Glasgow, the foundation so that every professional financial decision takes climate change into account. They think about climate risk as they're making their financial decisions and that influences that. And so I think the COP process, um, the innovations at Paris, which are very much being brought through to Glasgow, of holding countries to account in a transparent way, make, respecting their sovereignty, but holding them account, you know, having high ambition strategies from them, these quote NDCs, critically important, an objective add up of those NDCs, but energizing that and bringing it down to people through subnational governments, regional governments, municipalities, companies that people work for, institutions they work for, and them to have plans as well. You've been very outspoken on the role of finance and the investment sector in driving change towards uh, climate safe or climate resilient economies. How would you assess where we are now and what are the next big steps? I mean, there are big issues around physical climate change, but actually it's the, uh, the risks and the opportunities for the financial sector of the transition of where we are today as an economy to where we need to get to so-called transition risk. Um, and that is an area where the thinking really is only beginning to develop and the sophistication is developing. So that, that needs to be um, built in to how the financial sector takes climate into account with every financial decision. So, that's the context. Uh, question is, what do you do about it? And the way we've organized our work um, between now and Glasgow is to simplify around three R's. First on reporting. So that's to um, make sure that uh, not just the static risks, in other words, the greenhouse gas footprint of any company is reported, but what they're going to do about it, how they intend to manage them. The second pillar though is around risk itself. So risk management techniques around climate risk. And, and when you think about um, some of the work that uh, the students and faculty uh, would do at Royal Roads, I mean, this is one of the key areas, the emerging areas, because you're looking at um, a forward-looking risk. In other words, past is not prologue in terms of determining the probability distribution of the risk, if I can talk in those terms. And the case with climate is that it is shifting all the time and events that used to be in the tail of, uh, of the distribution are moving into the, to the center of the distribution, the most more likely effect. Um, and so you need uh, very sophisticated and new techniques in order to do that. Um, and you also need to recognize as um, whether you're managing an insurance company, a, a, an asset portfolio, a bank, that this is a risk that over time from which you cannot diversify. You can't diversify away from climate risk. And the third pillar is really around uh, returns um, and how um, do um, investors seize the opportunities around climate? Because recall that we're moving from where we are today to where we need to get to net zero. Um, those huge amount of investment that will take place um, and there's huge value that will be both created and destroyed depending on whether a company is above or below that, or below that line of the transition. And the way, again, if I loop back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of how the international process is organized, the COP process is organized, for all of those pillars, what we're doing as part of COP is guiding, catalyzing largely the private sector to develop these instruments as much as possible, and then having uh, the official sector adjust them so that they serve uh, the people that, that we all serve. Effectively, the G20 through the COP uh, process, the Paris COP process, set an exam question, um, just like some of your students will get exam questions, but exam question uh, for um, something called the FSB, which is the group of regulators that at the time I was chairing. Um, uh, the question was how to, um, uh, how to report and manage climate-related financial risks. There's really two types of these risks. There's the physical risks, you know, an extreme weather event or a fire or 
uh, um, some uh, permafrost melting, those those types of physical adjustments, um, uh, or or and rather um, transition risks. Um, the moving from where we are today to where we need to get to in certain industries benefiting from that and others um, being hurt by that because they're not part of the solution. Um, and so we uh, commissioned um, a group of private sector experts um, to come up with the type of information they felt they needed to uh, reveal those risks and manage those risks. And so something called the TCFD and what's happened since then is that about, well, uh, the last count I looked at, about 1,300 of the world's largest companies in over 70 countries um, are now disclosing this information. And basically everybody of size in the financial sector is asking uh, for this information. So if you total up all the balance sheets of all the asset managers, insurers, and banks, et cetera, who want this information, it's $140 trillion. Uh, US, which sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, I can assure you. The next step on that is really to take something that was catalyzed by the public sector through the Paris process, developed by the private sector. The private sector is now using it, but it needs to be made mandatory um, so that it extends you know, across all sectors, not everybody's implementing this, and across all geographies. So that's what we want to, that's one thing we want to accomplish uh, by COP. Um, I'll give you one other example. Uh, there's many things, but one other example of what we want to accomplish is that um, it's difficult for any of us um, to tell exactly how our money is being invested, um, whether it's you know a deposit in a bank or uh, through a pension fund or an RESP or, or, or RRSP, however, um, how is it being invested relative to this objective of sustainability. And so one of the things we're working on is how um, companies can, or investors and others can report uh, the impact of their investments on the temperature, just to rate it relative to, um, is it consistent with Paris? Is it consistent with uh, temperatures only rising or rising by less than two degrees? Or is it consistent with the base case of the global economy right now, which is unfortunately temperatures rising something like four degrees by the end of the of this century. Um, and if, if it's the latter, what are they doing about it, if anything, to manage it towards the former? Um, and so that type of technology, if I can call it that, it is a form of technology, um, is being developed in concert with a number of experts and uh, I think it could play quite an important role. Um, I want, to, I want to flag one other thing, if I could, just in terms of what else needs to be done. It's a longer list, but one other thing that's, um, if it works, will be critical, um, which is around developing markets or um, nature-based solutions. So think reforestation, carbons, natural carbon sinks, um, and um, other carbon offsets. Um, so this isn't um, emission trading markets, but it's actual offset markets. Um, these markets or these, these flows are very small right now. There's about $300 million a year, um, which is very modest and huge ranges of different price and quality. Um, and these need to be professionalized. This should be measured in the tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars a year in flows. Um, and it could be one of the big mechanisms by which money flows from advanced to emerging and developing economies um, and uh, pr uh, protects natural habitats uh, while ensuring that we're on a path collectively to net zero. And that's all money from the private sector, just to be absolutely clear. It's a, it's a consequence of um, uh, private action and private desire to, um, uh, to do this in the most efficient ways. There is a broader point as well, which is that um, this, this needs to be a whole economy transition. So every sector, every company needs to uh, try to adjust to net zero. And uh, if, if, if an investment pool, whether it's a university endowment or a pension fund or others, um, wants to support that move, um, then they need a way to objectively judge that and communicate that to uh, stakeholders, broader stakeholders, which very much includes students and faculty. Um, and, uh, and then they can judge whether that, th those investments are, are well-placed. 
Um, and uh, so I, I think one of the things just to get across that we're very conscious of is um, we don't have much time, number one. Number two, the scale of investment that's required is enormous, measured in the trillions and trillions of dollars every year of incremental investment, higher investment than normal. Um, and we won't get there in a niche. We won't get there just through divestment. We won't get there through just um, uh, as important as that is and important as um, uh, green bonds or, or pure green investments, we need, we need the way we talk about it, we need 50 shades of green. We need to be moving from mm. brown to olive to light green to green. Um, and the investments all organized around that, uh, that principle um, at speed. I think a career in climate action, climate leadership is, is definitely to be recommended. It's what we need. We need both elements. Um, leadership and action, leaders who catalyze action, leaders who understand the implications of those actions. And since this is a whole economy um, transition that's required, every sector um, will have elements of climate leadership and climate action um, such that it just becomes mainstream. It's hugely important that we do this in a way, and we have the opportunity to do this in a way, um, that has only been reinforced through um, the experience of COVID um, in a way that builds a more distributed uh, economy. You know, success in this area, whether it's in finance or more broadly in the economy, is that climate action, climate leadership um, is so much a part of the mainstream that we drop the adjective climate um, and its action and leadership and remembering that the point of action and leadership is for the benefit of as many people as possible and the benefit of our, our neighbors, um, our colleagues, um, and uh, broader, broader society. Well, thank you, Mark, for that. I know the challenges are very daunting, but um, I think you paint a picture of a future you know, for, for our country, but, but also for the world, which is, which is very encouraging. And there's um, you know, tremendous opportunity out there we hope that our program around climate action and the other work we're doing in climate action will make a, a small contribution towards that effort. So I really wanted to thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure, uh, this interview, um, but also to acknowledge your incredible leadership and the leadership you continue uh, to demonstrate uh, in this area. And we really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us. Mm -hmm.